A good Wednesday morning to you on this June 2nd, and welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson with you alongside Sarah Hoyle, Samuel Brooks. We've got a great show in store, uh, including in just a moment, uh, Canadian Senator, she's out of Alberta, Dr. Patty Labucane Benson is going to join us. We're going to talk about uh, what she's working on right now, she and, and some of her Senate colleagues. Uh, there's a direct... Uh, correlation there's a direct fit there's a, certainly a direct re- uh, reference to many of the conversations that canadians are having uh today and have been having for the past week or or depending on your perspective for the past 100 years uh conversations around reconciliation and our ugly history of residential schools this of course prompted or stirred up again uh, put back on our radar by the discovery of 215 bodies the bodies of young children uh on the grounds of what is a former residential school near kamloops bc and we'll talk to the senator about that that's coming up in just a moment we're also going to talk to the founder of a group the on canada project today they've, they've been focusing their efforts it's it's a citizen group kind of a citizen action group uh their efforts on COVID 19 but they've done a quick pivot and they've they've got a new initiative right now on on how settlers can take action and this is a direct uh response i think to some of the questions that you've been asking us in our live chat using our hashtag on the comment section um you know basically what we're reading on on youtube and where you're reaching us in our email inbox you're hitting us on all fronts in the best way in an engaged way in a sincere way saying what can we do and we're exploring these avenues along with you many of you are putting these on our radar which is excellent and we're grateful for that this show is presented by the team at bitcoin well there are presenting sponsor they have been since day one and, and we're grateful for what they've been bringing to the mix the team at bitcoin well of course helping people make sense of what's going on in crypto right now a big dip after a skyrocketing first number of months uh, to 2021. So what's the deal? People are trying to make sense of it. The team at Bitcoin Well is a great place to go with your questions. You'll find them under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We're going to be getting to comments made by uh, Alberta's Premier Jason uh, Kenney coming up in just a minute. Of course, jumping to the defense of Sir John A. Macdonald's and statues everywhere uh, to the surprise of of literally nobody. We're going to get to comments made uh, by Grand Chief Vernon Watchmaker from the Confederacy of Treaty 6 First Nations. That'll be coming up a little bit later on in the broadcast. But right now, it's, it's my pleasure to welcome to the show a senator out of Alberta. Uh, a, a senator, of course, that's serving Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Uh, Métis from Treaty 6 territory in Alberta, Senator Patty Labucane benson It's a real pleasure to welcome you to Real Talk. In fact, making your debut this morning. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ryan. Nice to be here. It's, it's great to have you here, Senator. For, for people that don't know, your 30-year career before you... Uh, joined the Senate uh, before you accepted that responsibility uh, was to serve your community more than 30 years as a director of a Boys and Girls Club in St. Paul uh, through 23 years of service with the Native Counseling Services of Alberta. And of course, you've been doing a ton of work, your Ph.D. work in human ecology, focusing on how indigenous families and communities experience resilience in response to multiple forms of trauma. You have various, if I can say, angles of approach to what Canadians are wrestling with right now. How are you processing this discovery in Kamloops? You know, um, I've had the good fortune in my life to sit in the circle with many, many elders um, in teaching circles and sharing circles. And uh, these stories are not new. We have known that there have been children that died at residential schools. Every survivor has those stories. We've known that there have there is mass graves at residential schools across this country. And this discovery is horrific. It was uh, expected by survivors. And I think Canadians need to get ready because there are going to be many more. So (laughs) you say that, and then I just, it just, it hits me right between the eyes because we know it to be true. And our, our, our expert guests yesterday said it and experts have been saying it for days now. Um, and I want to point out that many people have been saying it for years, for decades now. What does that yeah. mean, though? Where, how do you perceive uh, or where do you perceive the onus to be now? 
here's the thing. Um, for decades, survivors were not believed on many different levels. You know, they were talking about things they weren't believed. Um, they've been talking about the death of children for years and they have not been believed. The onus now is we need to, number one, we need to now investigate all the residential schools. We need the truth to be known across this country. Um, there's people who have <clears throat> said that this is a crime scene. I would agree. I, I don't know if prosecution is going to be possible now, but in any instant that instance it's possible, I think people need to be held accountable for what they've done. And I think the records of residential schools need to be finally fully opened for Canada. Um, we will never get to reconciliation until we understand the full truth, the full, have a full understanding of what happened at residential schools. And it's not, it has not been fair, it continues not to be fair to leave survivors to carry this burden of the truth of residential schools on their own. Canadians have to carry this burden. All of us, every single one of us has to carry it. We have to embrace the truth. I don't want to dismiss uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report by implying that no one has taken it seriously. But if you look at the at the track record of the performance of our country, um, of different levels of government, of citizens, of institutions, since those recommendations were released, we, we've we, we've certainly implemented a, but a handful of them. Um, that's not because there was a lack of participation. It's not because hundreds or thousands of people didn't dig deep into revisiting their own trauma and sharing and testifying and taking up the commission's invitation, accepting that invitation to testify. But I think generally speaking, it would be a safe statement to suggest that Canada hasn't done much with that report, the findings of that report to this point. Would you agree? Well, okay, so there's a website. It's called Delivering on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action. And for every single recommendation, there is a what's happening. Um, for the pieces that are the federal government's responsibility, the federal government is talking about what they're doing. If it's not theirs, you know, some of it is for the province, municipalities. Um, there's, there's responsibility for all of us to take up. So um, there is action on the TRC. I would also say that, you know, um, I, in the last parliament, got to work on Bill uh, C-92, and that was directly in response to call to action number four, that the jurisdiction of Indigenous children should reside in Indigenous communities, not with the province and not with the feds. Um, the calls to action 13 and 14, uh, we are working on Bill C-15 right now to implement the, um, the UNDRIP, uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, you know, calls to action 50, the government's working on that one right now um, to reinvigorate, you know, um, Indigenous law systems. Uh, call to action 80, I'm so happy to say the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. I believe that we are going to be in a position to pass, if not on Thursday in the Senate, very soon, the, the next week, that that bill will actually go to royal assent very quickly, and we are going to have that day. So, you know, there is action, and I'm not here to defend the federal government this or any last one. Um, the government moves at a glacial pace, and it is it the thing that has floored me becoming a senator is just how slowly things move, how there's this process and it's pedantic and it takes time. And I'm trying to embrace it. I'm a very impatient person, but I'm trying to understand why things move this slowly. There's a lot of things we can do as Canadians that would directly address the TRC calls to action. We don't need government to do it. So I would recommend every single Canadian get on the delivering the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action website, see what they each person can do pick one and work on it and if i, I would I, I would be happy to work with folks on those right on those um calls to action uh senator it's uh, I, I, we can all appreciate i think you know how, how legislation works or get a, at least a general understanding of it that oftentimes that that a, that a law that may be passed to receive royal assent to address a tragedy may come years after the fact we contrast that and, and this is apples and oranges but we contrast that with what we saw for example out of the city of calgary yesterday the calgary board of education renaming langevin school as riverside school effective immediately 
uh, one meeting, mm-hmm. a decision made and done. Uh, much to the chagrin, a matter of fact, as it seems of, of, of Alberta's premier. I'm not sure if you have a comment on that. We'll get to cancel culture uh, after I chat with you. But is this a step in the right direction? Do you, do you think names like Bishop Grandin or even Sir Johnny McDonald, the architects of residential schools, should be pulled down from institutions like schools? As a Métis woman, yeah, I think we need to do that work. I fully support changing the name of that school. I, I like what's going on in PEI. I think that um, these these statues, these names are triggering, and we need to be better. And I'm very proud of the um, of Calgary for doing what they did and taking that firm stand. I think that I, I fully support it, and I, I think that those are the spaces where we can move quicker, where we can make a difference in in a expedient way. And I support all of that, Senator. We talk about this. Uh you know, the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Sam, could you call up that tweet again? This uh, from the Canadian Senate. This is getting Canadians up to speed. It it discusses the work of Bill C-15. And I know that you can talk to us about this, Senator. Uh, it The bill would require the government to implement an action plan to achieve the declaration's objectives. It would have to ensure that measures are taken, necessary measures to ensure Canadian laws are consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, at, at a layperson's level of understanding, for the average person listening to this show or watching you now live, what does that mean? What would change? Okay, so um, first of all, that declaration was worked on by Indigenous people locally, like Dr. Willie Littlechild, and globally for over two decades. Um, Canada adopted it in 2010 with some reservations, and then we adopted it fully in 2016. Right now, <clears throat> that declaration can be used to interpret Canadian law, meaning that, you know, if there's a judge decision coming down, the judge is compelled to look at UNDRIP and use that to interpret Canadian law right now. Um, so the, the bill kind of reiterates that and say, yes, we need to do that, and we need to do that more. Um, the two obligations on behalf of the government is to take our laws right now, existing laws and the laws that are we're contemplating in the future, and examine them through the lens of this declaration. Examine them through the lens of basic human rights for Indigenous people. That's what UNDRIP is. It's about make, getting basic human rights for Indigenous people. The other thing it compels the government to do is to consult and cooperate with Indigenous leadership across this country to create an action plan to deal with the more insidious um, aspects of reconciliation that we need to do in Canada, the things that are harder to get at, you know, the systemic racism. Um, We need to really dig into our policies and the way that we operate in this country and find ways to to be better. So that's what the action plan is about. Um, The harmonization of laws. So the action plan is two years to get done and completed. And every year a report is going to be made and tabled in front of parliament to talk about progress on that. Um, The harmonization of laws is one that I'm particularly interested in. We need legislation to deal with the fiduciary responsibilities of our government for Indigenous people in ways that are are decolonized, in ways that are um, uh, we create these laws in collaboration and cooperation and consultation with Indigenous people. And finally, finally get to the point where we can repeal the Indian Act this is the whole, What we need to get rid of the Indian Act, but we can't do that until we have enabling legislation for all of the things that the Indian Act does right now. Bill C-92 in the last parliament, the Child Welfare Act, that was enabling legislation. You know, we need more of that. We need housing legislation. We need a health act. We need, we need all this legislation in place so that we can finally say goodbye to the Indian Act. Can I, can I, this is, this is almost an unfair question because it's, it's so big focus uh, but if you're if you were to get rid of the Indian Act, if these bills were to uh, receive royal assent and we'll talk about C-15 and 262 and all these different bills and the numbers can swirl around and I wouldn't blame people for kind of getting lost a little bit, trying to keep track at all. But what would you envision this country looking like? What would Canada's relationship be with indigenous people? Can we give us some runway here 25 years from now? Uh, what would it look like? I understand I'm asking you a massive question, but generally speaking. 
Listen, I, I know exactly what I'm working towards. There's um, the elders' teachings of Wahoto and this this big uh, doctrine uh, that the Cree people have that is the laws about how that govern our relationships with each other. These the relationships with Canada will look and Indigenous people will look like kindness, respect, humility, caring, sharing. We only have to look to the to the intent and the spirit of the treaties to understand um, what Indigenous people were hoping to achieve in the treaty, and what we as Canadians need to fulfill in those treaties and therefore in the relationships with Indigenous people. I use the treaties as an example because, you know, um, some of the t- chiefs say we don't even need UNDRIP. We have the treaties. If the treaties were fulfilled in the way that, you know, if the treaty promises were realized, we wouldn't need UNDRIP. And that's true. Not in, all Indigenous people have a treaty um, document, treaty contract that was signed, treaty agreement. Uh, we do need UNDRIP, but we already know what that relationship could look like. It's, um, it's listen, it's not complicated. It just takes a lot of humility, a lot of capacity for all of us to um, figure out what we're going to sacrifice, you know, or where our fears are. Why are we so afraid to have basic human rights for Indigenous people? What does that mean? Uh, and where does that fear come from? We have a lot of unpacking to do. The The word genocide uh, comes into play here. I, we had a conversation yesterday. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was on, and he said he, he would have a hard time, if I can paraphrase, he said he'd have a, a pretty difficult time finding another word other than genocide to describe a scenario where you find 215 bodies in, in a mass unmarked grave outside an institution of learning outside of school that might be one clue if you, if you talk about genocide as an endeavor to erase culture or people or bloodlines some of this seems to fit but you, you certainly have uh, you know i mean alberta's premier's uh, speechwriter who just retired a few months ago you know his, his his comment on residential schools is the bogus genocide story that was paul bunner a lot of people r- really are, are triggered by the use of the word genocide in this context where do you land on this was this is this genocide the TRC said it was genocide that was affirmed by a Supreme Court judge. It's genocide. Full stop. Why do you think it's important that Canadians acknowledge that specific word? Listen, regardless of what uh, people think about the word genocide or um, the fear that it triggers or the, the, the guilt, the shame that it might trigger, the word applies. I'm. I am not a. I'm not going to argue with a Supreme Court judge. I don't think any of us should. I think that they. It's been. It's been laid out quite clearly how this term applies and why it fits. What we all need to do is to approach this with a great deal of humility. Uh, understand how why that term fits. What happened in Canada, and we need to embrace this truth. We need to embrace our history. Uh, I've worked with a lot of elders who have said we have to come to a shared understanding of our history if we're going to move forward. You know, those elders have always said no blame, no shame, no guilt. Those are useless emotions. They're not going to get us moving this thing forward. Uh, we're not asking people to take on the shame or the the guilt of this. We're asking them to embrace a truth and then to feel if it's angry, whatever they need to feel, to get up off their seats and do something about it. And anger is an emotion that motivates us. Blame, shame, and guilt that just cause defensiveness. I'm not interested in it. I'm mm. really interested in motivation. I, I agree with you. Uh, blame for sure. Shame and guilt can be internal feelings. They can be self-imposed. And I feel like a lot mm-hmm. of people are feeling shame. I would be among them, people that are feeling shame. And, and I know that the, the, the cynics and the critics... And, and, and those that would describe this all as a bleeding heart exercise, you know, w- would talk about white guilt or settlers guilt. Or they, they use it as almost a derogatory term. But but how do you not feel shame? <laughs> I sure feel shame and I don't feel bad about it. As a matter of fact, I joined the chorus of millions of other Canadians. I think who are feeling shame right now. It's not necessarily negative. I take the point you're making and I recognize that, that this exercise, the bigger exercise needs to be a more broad conversation and ultimately community with millions of people. Uh, but I don't know how anybody would not feel shame right now. 
Okay, so what I know about cognitive dissonance or what some scholars have called colonial dissonance is that the feelings of blame, shame, and guilt often back people up into a corner and make them feel like they need to defend, well, that wasn't me, that wasn't my ancestors, uh, I wasn't a part of that, I refuse to take that on. And this is these are the emotions and the reaction that we need to avoid. I am not going to place shame or blame on anybody. Of course, people are going to feel their feelings and, and they need to do that. What I'm most interested in is whatever emotion people need to feel to be motivated to make change, motivated to build relationships, to finally, finally move away from this us and them and understand that this country will not thrive, will not flourish without Indigenous people flourishing as well. And so whatever it takes to get us on the same page, I'm here for that. Mm-hmm. Beautifully said. I know that, you know, people can do their own research and do their own reading. We're, we're talking sort of in and out. Maybe my fault because I'm the one asking the questions. But Bill C-262, Bill C-15, Bill C-5. I, I know we could dig into each one of these individually. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that C-5 uh, would be the act to amend the Bills of Exchange Act, the Interpretation Act, the Canada Labor Code, which would uh, make way for a national day for truth and reconciliation. Why do you think that day is so important? How do you envision that becoming reality in Canada? I, I think this day is incredibly important. Uh, and I believe that the commissioners of the TRC knew that we need to commemorate, understand, think about, reflect upon the residential school experience every day, go every year going forward. I envision really robust curriculum for teachers and good training for teachers so that they actually feel confident to teach it about the residential school phenomenon, the legacy and the history of intergenerational trauma that still exists today. I, I, you know, if you look at Germany and the work that Germany has done in their commemoration of World War II and how engaged young people are in the legacy of um, Nazism and the legacy of, of the uh, atrocities that happened to Jewish people, they really shine a light on how powerful commemoration is. We need to commemorate, we need to talk about it. We need a day every year where we pause, think about residential schools, reflect upon the children that died specifically, but also the survivors who have had to carry this burden all these years. We need, we need a, a place and a space to think, reflect and get motivated for action. And so um, Bill C-5, and like I said, I really think we're going to be able to get this one done this week. Uh, this is an important, important piece of legislation. Um, wanted to just check in on our live chat. There's always great conversations uh, going on here. I mean, Scott says the fact that in 2021, there's a lack of safe, clean drinking water uh, for, for many indigenous communities, for many First Nations. That should be a source of shame. Canada is a wealthy nation and and shame on us. Uh, others are saying, you know, I mean, you know, Penny says it was my bloody ancestors, right? She says, <laughs> Penny's looking in. She says, my family was kicked out of Scotland. She says, we came to Canada just to become as atrocious as those in the first place. Tracy says there could be many more than 215 bodies outside that school. They found 215 graves. Graves. There could have been more than one body in any given grave. I mean, people are having these conversations. People are bracing themselves. We were talking with a, a an archaeologist yesterday, Senator, that, I mean, she had such wonderful points to make about consultation and recognizing mm-hmm. sensitivities and sovereignty and, and who needs to be uh, making the decisions on what happens next and where it happens and whether or not forensic investigations happen. Even the, you know, the verbiage, the vernacular, do we call it? Uh, a crime scene, recognizing some of the, the strained relationships or problematic relationships between some indigenous people and law enforcement. I mean, there's so much to think about. And I find that 15 minutes ago when you said that, when you said there are more, there will be more. I mean, I I just, I feel like this nation is, it, this feels like the beginning. And, um, you know, we whether it's a day of mourning to, to bring everyone together, whether it's a, a second round of hearings, whether, however this happens, and, and, and perhaps you have a vision on what you think would be a responsible way for things to happen next. I feel like I'm speaking as an individual here. I feel like I'm just bracing myself. Do you have that same sense? 
totally. I, I, um, but I want to make it clear in the indigenous community has been bracing themselves for a long time. Yes. This isn't new. This is, this is, um, in many ways, uh, we've been waiting for this to happen because survivors were not necessarily believed when they talked about how many deaths they witnessed as children in residential school. They didn't, they were not necessarily believed they, you know, there's, there was a bit of dissonance around that, that this couldn't have happened. They were kids. They might not have understood. No, they understood. I'll never forget sitting in the circle and listening to an elder talk about his responsibility was to dig these graves. And he carried that burden his entire life. So um, I think uh, your guest was absolutely right. Everything has, there has to be consultation. There has to be relationship built that this has to be driven by communities. It can't be driven by the federal government, but the federal government has to be a partner to make sure that this unfolds in a way that makes sense for communities, that there is a lot of trauma counseling available, that there's community-based, culturally appropriate historic trauma healing programs and services and initiatives that go around the, um, the dealing with these uh, mass graves. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of healing to do. And Canadians can be part of that healing. You know, non-Indigenous Canadians can be supportive, can be, um, can be part of this healing movement. We can help carry this burden. It does not have to be left on First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Yeah, I mean, there, it, it, it's kind of this. Uh, it's almost it's 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 a it's a balance, or it's it's uh, sort of a, a two pronged um, onus that's being placed, I think, upon non Indigenous Canadians right now to uh, step up and take meaningful action, and also to sit back and listen, and and yep. like shut up for once. And listen, and uh, and finding that balance uh, is not an easy exercise. But it's why we're grateful for conversations like this. Do you think that's a reasonable way to describe the reality right now? I I agree. I agree. We have to listen to survivors. Absolutely, we have to continue listening. We have to believe them. We need them to know that we validate their experience. We care deeply about them. That this that this is a Canadian responsibility to carry, not just theirs. At the same time, there are actions folks can take across this country to make this, uh, you know, to create this safe space for dialogue, to, um, you know, to, to work on things that are important. Uh, you're, uh, one of the people brought up clean drinking water. It's an important issue. I mean, the government, I think they've solved 170 cases and another hundred have come up. I, I, those are probably wrong numbers, but this is an ongoing issue in First Nations. And you know what? There's a good uh, example just west of the city here where Lac St. Anne, I believe Alexis, maybe Paul Band, a bunch of people got together, municipalities and First Nations, and they resolved clean drinking water issues together. You know, what a, what a concept. Municipalities and First Nations saying, hey, we all need drinking water. We're all in this area. Can we work together? Um, and if you, if you want, uh, you know, uh, Lauren Alsvik was heading that up at Lac St. Anne with uh, Chief Tony Alexis, I believe. They've done fantastic work that didn't, you know, the federal government didn't have to go in there and intervene at all. They, they figured it out, made a plan and executed on the plan. It's a beautiful thing. We can all do those kinds of things at a very local level. We can be part of the solution. We'll give you a producer credit when we conduct those interviews, Senator. I'm looking forward to learning more about that go. project. That's a great example, though. I mean, I think for a lot of Canadians, it's like, you know, there are things that fly under people's radar. And I get that everybody has so much going on in their own lives and so many things to keep an eye on. And, and you go, I, I haven't even heard about that or I didn't even realize that about my own country. I mean, there's communities that have been under boil water advisories for decades um, it's, you yep. know, we I imagine if, if an affluent suburb uh, was under a boil water advisory for 72 hours, uh, every level of government would be hearing about it. Uh, and it's just uh, an incredible yeah. double standard. Before we thank you for your time uh, and, and we recognize uh, the value of your time, we're grateful for your perspective, Senator. Um, I, I have to ask you about uh, another angle on this. I, I, I can't ignore the number of messages and the feedback we've received from people that have said, yeah, you're talking about residential schools and you're, and you're rightfully pointing out that they closed in the mid 1990s, which isn't that long ago, but people are saying that there are currently major issues 
with indigenous children in care and how these programs are administered, et cetera. I mean, you were appointed just a few years ago, right, to uh, 2017, 2018 by, uh, to the Alberta Ministerial Panel for Child Intervention. Um, that resulted in Bill 18, the Child Protection and Accountability Act, and, and the focus, and I'm hoping you can tell us uh, and take us into this and help us understand it, the focus of that panel, reducing the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care in Alberta. Now, I recognize we could talk about this for hours or for days, uh, but what's the yep. most, what are the most important details f- for, for the average Canadian to understand about current issues right now? What I would say about that is um, the the jurisdiction jurisdictional issue is still a big deal. Um, you know, the jurisdiction over Indigenous children is being um, fought. You know, taken to court by the the government of Quebec, the province of Quebec, and I believe Alberta is an intervener on that case. Uh, Bill C Bill C ninety two the Indigenous Child Welfare Act, the whole purpose of it was to begin the transition of jurisdiction of Indigenous children back to Indigenous communities and organizations and families. Because right now, the federal government transferred the jurisdiction of Indigenous children who live off reserve um, to the provinces. And it's a very complicated issue and it's being um, fought in court. And I, for me, the most important, important part of this is that Indigenous people should have jurisdiction control over the care of their own children. Um, the fact that we're fighting about this jurisdiction is just mind blowing. And that's one thing if people want to phone their MPs, we, you know, and their MLAs. We, we need Indigenous people to be able to care for their own children. This is a legacy that goes back to the first child apprehended in residential school. It's, um, and we're still fighting that, that battle. I, I, it's mind-blowing in 2021 that we're still doing that. Dr. Patty Labacane benson is a Canadian senator from Treaty 6 Territory in Alberta. We didn't even have a chance like we did the last time you and I spoke on a, on a different radio station to talk about your graphic novel, which is just absolutely wonderful. Uh, but let me point people in the general direction of it. The outside circle uh, they can check it out. Uh, proudly have it in, in, in uh, my bookcase at home. Senator, it's, it's a beautiful and important uh, work of art. I want to thank you so much for your time and your perspective this morning and for your continued work in the Red Chamber. Thank you. Hey, Ryan, I'm a huge fan of this show, and I love your new format. Thank you for including me in the conversation. I appreciate it. Well, I look forward to talking to you again, Senator. Thanks very much. Uh, That's Dr. Patty Labuken Benson, a a Canadian senator out of Alberta. Checking on the live chat, I can see it's great to see so many people watching us live. We can see those of you uh, streaming us live on the Mixler audio app as well, taking us on the go. We thank you for that. Interesting comments here. People are saying, uh, and, and I lost the comment. I apologize. I can't attribute it. I usually like to give you a shout out if I can. But somebody said, you know, we're, we're talking about how, how we're all in this together. We need to avoid divisive language. But people are talking about, you know, colonialism or the word settler. And I saw somebody tweet yesterday, and it very well may have been. I know I, need, I should try to take better notes. I usually walk around with a pen. If you, if you stop me on the street at any point, I probably have a pen in my pocket and some crumpled up piece of paper. Sometimes it's a, it's a half half of an envelope that's been ripped off and I'm writing on the back side. It's the legacy of my grandpa, Stan. He left me with that. He was the one that was always keeping notes and I write notes and I try to keep those as, as organized as I can for reasons like this. I don't know who tweeted it. It may very well have been our next guest, uh, Samantha uh, Christian Apply, the founder of On Canada Project. We're going to talk about that. Settlers Take Action is the name of the project. So this seems like a good segue. But the tweet yesterday said words like colonial or settler are not inherently dirty words. They're not intended to be offensive words. They're descriptors. You're seeing it more and more on people's Twitter bios. You see several trends. We talked, Sarah, about pronouns the other day, and this is unrelated, but maybe not. I don't know that it is. Yeah, maybe it's not unrelated. I don't mean to to, to, to dismiss it, but uh, you're seeing some. I, I'm seeing people across the country. Uh, some people start to describe themselves as, for example, a settler living on Treaty Six territory, and I don't see it as some sort of a self-effacing, shame-wrapped exercise i think i see it as an acknowledgement i think that's precisely it and it's i mean to dovetail with the pronouns discussion that we had it's about the creating of space it's about acknowledging where i am in 
you know, the ecosystem of Canada. Yeah. Um, so to me, it's, it's about that, that creating of space. Um, I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I don't have it on my Twitter bio. I've been, I've been kind of, you know, going back and forth on it, trying to figure out, like, I don't want it. Cause then there's that piece around like being performative. It's a, it's a performative effort. It's, a, it's, you know, I think everybody's got to make their own decisions on Absolutely. that. I think it's great. I'm here all day to talk about it. I'll tell you that much. I love talking about that kind of stuff. I, I, I think we can have a compelling conversation on why people don't put that kind of stuff in their Twitter bio. You know? But I, but I love the point that, yeah, settler is not a dirty word. It's, um, it's important that we recognize our relationship to the land and our relationship to... Well, think about the context of it. I mean, I, you know, I'm, 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 maybe I'm making this up in my mind, but I know as a kid that grew up in Southern Alberta, I grew up in Calgary. The word settler has not always been a dirty oh. word. It, it, yeah. As a matter of fact, you, I, I can think of things that were, that were named after settlers, like settlers village or like things like this. I mean, it, it was, it's only who it's coming from in the context in which it's used that can create some sort of a supercharged narrative. Mm. I remember growing up, nobody seemed to mind that word. Until it became maybe a little bit more problematic. Uh, Dwayne on our live chat says, well, what do we say to people who think this never happened or think that it's a distraction? He wonders what the senator would have said about that. Let, let me answer. I mean, how do you treat people that deny the Holocaust? And tell them to go fuck themselves for starters. Um, I mean, like, what do you what's what's the argument that it never happened? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much concerned. I shouldn't say I'm not concerned. I think denialism is a problem. But these are the fringe loons. I'm more concerned about people that try to normalize it or people that try to, to, to simply brush it off as a, as, a, as a piece of our history. And we'll talk a little bit later on in the show about, I mean, how this is landing with a thud in the province of Alberta. I mean, people close to Alberta's premier are on the offensive. I keep talking about Chris Champion. Many of you keep talking about him. He's the guy that's been tapped on the shoulder by the premier by the government of Alberta to author the social studies curriculum. This is this is the guy behind the Dorchester Review. The one's talking about the the politics and the cashola, the word he uses. In this time in this he didn't write that three weeks ago. He didn't write that a year ago. The politics and the cashola of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We've reached out to an expert guest out of Manitoba. Hope to have them on the show. I'm putting Sarah in a tough spot. I don't typically say who we've reached out to, but not yet confirmed. I'll keep it somewhat vague. But an expert guest out of Manitoba, we hope to have on the show in the next couple of days, tweeting about this the other day, talking about what the response needs to look like and what allyship looks like and, and what the settler response should be and difficult conversations like conversations like you have when 215 bodies of children are discovered outside of school and you recognize that that's just one damn straight you're having difficult conversations what's the response from the author or at least the outlet the guy writing alberta's social studies curriculum yeah well most of them died from tuberculosis most of them some of them their families wanted them to be there i mean this is what this is the guy just writing the curriculum the social studies curriculum or the bogus genocide story, as Paul Bunner took it. The speechwriter that Premier Kenny refused to fire. Let's get to it. So this is Alberta's premier yesterday. So in Calgary, the Calgary Board of Education acts swiftly to rename a school, Langevin School, named after Bishop Langevin, one of the architects of residential schools in Canada. They're, they're renaming, they're re renaming it it was riverside school until the 1930s then it was named langevin school now they're taking it back to its original name i wonder how many people cried foul when they stripped the name riverside school to name it after bishop langevin you think there was any protest there you're canceling the riverside will there be any sides left to the river if we cancel the name we're canceling riverside to, to name it after some religious leader there was no protest i'm sure and the Calgary Board of Education deserves credit for acting swiftly on this and renaming the school. Alberta's premier was asked about it and, and asked what he thinks about further initiatives. Like, should the city of St. Albert rename the neighborhood Grandin, named after Bishop Grandin, another architect of these schools? I read some of his deplorable comments. And, and again, these comments are 140 years old, 100 years old, 90 years old. We're, we're going way deep here. My sister is a graduate of Bishop Grandin High School. 
in Calgary. You know, she played basketball for, for them. And, I'm, and I wonder, I haven't spoken with Megan. She lives in Vancouver. As you know, I'm curious to know where, where she lands. I, I, I know where she lands on this. <laughs> she, she might actually be on her way to Alberta right now with a pry bar to take the sign down herself, knowing my sister, God love her. So the premier's asked about that and Sir John A. Macdonald and the statues coming down. What was it, two years ago, something like that, that the city of Victoria pulled down the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald outside its city hall? Those aren't statues that are being smashed in the square, a la Saddam Hussein. You can move them to museums. The question, really, the debate is where do they belong and what message does it send to leave them up? And, and here's what Jason Kenney had to say about it yesterday when asked by a reporter. A bill in the House of Commons with a Liberal colleague uh, to recognize Sir John A. Macdonald Day, uh, to acknowledge our founding Prime Minister, without whom Canada would not exist. Uh, and uh, as his uh, authoritative contemporary biographer Richard Gwynne said, no Macdonald, no Canada. I think Canada is worth uh, celebrating. I think Canada is a great historical achievement. It is a country that people all around the world seek to join as new Canadians. It is an imperfect country, but it is still a great country, just as John Macdonald was an imperfect man, but was still a great leader. Uh, if we want to get into uh, cancelling every uh, f figure in our history who, had, uh, who, who took positions on, on issues at the time that we now judge harshly and rightly, uh, in, in, in historical retrospective, but if that's the new standard, then um, I think almost the entire founding leadership of our country gets cancelled. Tommy Douglas, who recommended the use of eugenics uh, to um, uh, sterilize the weak, as he said, uh, to, uh, if we talk about mem members of the, fa fa the famous five, uh, heroes of Canadian feminism and the fight for equality for women, uh, some of them were advocates of uh, eugenics that we would now regard uh, as deplorable. So uh, if we go full f force into cancel culture, then we're canceling uh, uh, most, if not all, of our history. Instead, I think we should learn from our history. We should learn uh, from our achievements, but also our failures. Uh, Canada is doing that. So that's Premier Jason Kenney yesterday. It prompted Luke Fevin to post yesterday slow clap for anyone crying cancel culture about ceasing to honor a man who was literally attempting to cancel an entire culture. So what the residential schools were. You want to talk about cancel culture? They probably had that painted over their staff room door. It was probably the rallying cry every morning. So what are other cities doing about it? Charlottetown City Council voted unanimously on Monday to remove the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald from a prominent location, downtown Charlottetown. They're going to put it in storage until council decides its next move. So you've got that out of Charlottetown, and, and this will continue. You'll see it continuing across Canada. Peter Haley tweeting yesterday, why the Premier of Alberta would stand with Sir John A. Macdonald at a time of great shame for the treatment of indigenous peoples of this nation is more than deplorable. If Canadian history books haven't been rewritten to include this horror and its architect, they should and must be now. We've got a ton of emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. How about this one from Laura received it yesterday? She said, Ryan, this isn't usual practice for me to write into a talk show I'm not active on any social media. I never have been. The whole idea of pe people hiding behind screens, never having the guts to say, you know, something to somebody's face, but saying it online never sat right with me. So she says, so I've, I've sort of taken a stand and I still stand on that same ground. She says, I mean, here's the thing. Something has to move me to feel my ground shake to have me write to you today. And it has, says Laura. The combination of your coverage of Pazzo, that young boy in Edmonton, that beating on the schoolyard. Ethan Bear, the Edmonton Oilers defenseman. Our question of the week is touching on Ethan Bear, by the way. We'll get to that later this show. And now the confirmation of 215 children found buried outside a residential school, in quotes, a school in Kamloops. I just can't keep quiet, says Laura. 
I worked for Child and Family Services in Calgary for five years. I went into that line of work wanting desperately to support families in a time of need to be a bridge for them to get their kids back into their custody. I saw my position as the first step to parents getting their children back. Children who'd been taken away by government, put into foster care for many different reasons, some very valid child welfare concerns, some not valid in any way, shape or form. I worked 12 to 16 hour days. I sacrificed relationships, travel, holidays, sleep, Christmas Day, you name it, to provide service to these families. And they all hated me. They hated my presence in their life, which I understand. And I never took it personally. It just made me work harder to get to the resolution stage. The day that I could return their children home to them. And over the five years, that happened once. As I made my way through the system, family after family, I began to realize that I would hate me too. And ultimately, I left the job because I didn't feel like I was on the right side of the law or the right side of the issue anymore. There was most definitely a larger representation of children in care from indigenous communities. That's certainly true. I write to you today really to say that I see our indigenous community. I can affirm what they are saying. I can fully attest to their fight still to this day to having their children taken from them. My heart breaks for them. Please have someone come on the show to help those of us with a driven spirit to know where our indigenous community needs us now. I will go there. I just need to know what they want or need from a privileged white girl like me. Perhaps they want nothing but my listening ears and my closed mouth, which I also respect. Whew. She goes on to say, with so much love and support from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pikani, the Sutina, the Ayaxi, Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation, Region 3, Treaty 7, from Laura, a real talker. A real talker. Laura, thank you for that. That's firsthand. That's powerful. You can reach us anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Every Wednesday morning, we partner with the team at Tourism Jasper to celebrate a very special region in Canada. Of course, Jasper National Park. We call the feature My Jasper Memories. And today, a wonderful focus on a community member that has absolutely transformed the way that people understand Jasper's indigenous history and heritage. Take a look at a portion of this video. You can see it in its entirety online. I've already tweeted the link. This is Matricia Bauer. I find that uh, Jasper as a whole is really connected to Indigenous culture, I think vicariously through nature. We have these taglines that are venture beyond and explore and um, beautiful by nature. And all of these, all of these things beg you to look up and out, even our dark sky. The flora that we experience and the plants that are around us are full of medicine. They're full of history. They're full of stories. They're full of songs. They're full of a symbiotic relationship that we actually rely on. So I think plant medicine and understanding the flora can also be a great lesson into how we sort of fit into the world as, uh, as a population, as a human species, and that we are human beings, uh, not human doings. I absolutely love that. We are human beings, not human doings. Uh, Matricia Bauer is the first profile in a new venture beyond series uh, that Tourism Jasper's just released, as a matter of fact, recently, uh, that aims to introduce people to some of the, the mountain town's most fascinating residents. And Matricia, if you've ever had the opportunity, the honor of meeting her in person, which I have, uh, I see this picture of her, my face is exploding into a smile because it just feels to me like her connection with this land, with this place, with nature, with the medicines, it is so evident. She she exudes it. 
and she shares it. She's got a business called Warrior Women, and she offers musical performances and workshops and, and tour shows and guided experiences every Wednesday evening in Jasper. As a matter of fact, she hosts a two and a half hour fireside chat experience. And on Tuesday afternoons during the warmer months, they're getting into that season right now. She also runs a plant walk, the Wapak Wanis Plant Walk, which introduces participants to some of the plants and trees in Jasper National Park through the lens of indigenous food and medicine. She says, if we can focus on all the good things about culture, show people the beauty that's part of our culture, then maybe they won't ever do things they did to our people again. They will respect us. They will love us. Matricia Bauer, an amazing Jasper local. You can find more. The Warrior Women feature on Tourism Jasper's website. I've, I've linked uh, again in my tweet this morning to that profile. If you want to watch the full video, you, you have to watch it. I encourage you to get to know her through the video. And of course, the next time you explore Jasper, to seek her out and to seek out those experiences and that knowledge. We're also, of course, very proud to partner with Tourism Jasper, as you know, every week. And you can find the link on the website. Just look for jasper.tourism, jasper.travel, rather, jasper.travel slash real talk, jasper.travel slash real talk. You can learn more about this wonderful, wonderful national park. And of course, we want to hear your Jasper memories. Use the hashtags myjasper and real talk RJ. You can hit us up on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. This is becoming one of my favorite things about Wednesday afternoons. After this feature, no doubt, seems about 5 or 10 or 15 people. The number grows every week. Share with us their Jasper memories, and we love it. Our thanks to the team at Tourism Jasper for this special focus. So we're talking about words and which words are important to acknowledge and, and which words can sting and which words must we wrestle with. And one of them is settlers. And there's a group that's encouraging settlers to take action. It's a group called On Canada. It's the On Canada Project. And it was originally formed, as a matter of fact, in response to COVID-19. But there's been a quick pivot, including by the group's founder, Samantha Krishnapalai, who joins us now live. Welcome to the show. Thank you for making time for us. Uh, Samantha, First of all, we've never met before. Did I pronounce your surname okay, or did, or do we need to start again? Uh, Samantha Krishna Pillay. Krishna Pillay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Can Can you tell us about On Canada and and how the On Canada project came about uh, approximately a year or so ago? Um. Yeah. Uh, uh, sure. So I guess the the project launched on June first of twenty twenty, actually, because. I just felt like the communications around the pandemic were not compassionate. They were not equitable. Um, they lacked a conversational tone. And I felt very privileged because I knew a lot of this, the, the context and the content because I'm, I've studied all that. I've, I've, I, that was my educational history, my undergrad and my master's. So it was easy for me, but not for everyone. But in order to get through the pandemic, we all have to have that information and We'd all have to have someone caring about us in a compassionate way. So that's sort of what led to the project starting. And I've been um, really lucky. It's It started in my brain, but it's now a child of 170 internet strangers that volunteer on the project. Um, all millennials and Gen Z across the country. And uh, they are, you know, sort of. I kind of think of them like a ragtag team of friendly neighborhood nerds and active citizens um, who just want to make a difference. Um, but yeah, the, the pivot, as you were mentioning, from um, more COVID communication to, you know, talking more about social inequities in our country, that's that's been happening slowly on our page. Um, it just so happened that this, this you know, got a lot of attention, but uh, we, we, we are focused on COVID-19 and helping all Canadians through that. But then the second component is understanding the society and system um, young Canadians, millennials, and Gen Z to, to to take action and to to want to make a difference, which I think comes across pretty clearly in this this post that we made. Yeah, and and it's obvious even just listening to you talk about the project. There's there's a lot of of, of personal uh, conviction uh, that comes into play here. I would imagine from from you as the founder all the way through to the people that are volunteering their time and their their efforts. Um, 
How have you personally been processing uh, this discovery out of Kamloops and how, how are you applying it to your perspective moving forward? Yeah, I, um, our team sort of met on Saturday as we were writing this post and we talked about it. Um, it was hard. I mean, it is hard. I don't know how you hear that news and not, uh, it, it brings everything to a stop. Um, and as it should. And I think what, what we sort of realized was what would quit, what would often happens with this type of stuff is the conversation becomes about, of what the government can do to be to 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 better support to to recon, reconcile with indigenous people and and a hundred percent a hundred percent they have to uh, and they should have been and they have a lot to own up to and reconcile with and do um but i didn't want us all of us that were sitting with that discomfort to feel like it was just a, a situation in which it was the government and Indigenous folk in the conversation around reconciliation, because as people who live in Canada, we have a responsibility uh, for reconciliation as well. And that's really where the post came from is, is just, you know, reminding people, inviting people, uh, encouraging people to act on that devastation they were feeling, um, rightfully so around this issue, because the 215 children that were found, uh, there are no words, but what's overwhelming is the fact that so many more are unaccounted for and that seven generations of Indigenous people lived with the personal and intergenerational trauma that came from the historical treatment of Indigenous folk, but continues to this day. It's not a history uh, note. It's not just like a past issue. It's a current issue. Uh, and one that Canada has to, Canada, Canadians, all of us, we need to deal with it. We need to talk about it. We need to we need to change the way we do things. Um, yeah. Krishna, I, I don't remember if it was you, Samantha, yesterday. Was it you that that, uh, that tweeted some, someone? Someone I know on my feed that I was paying close attention to yesterday tweeted something along the lines of settler is not a dirty word or settler is not an offensive word or settler is not a slur or something. I, I wish I could remember who it was. I saw it and I kind of went, oh, I'm going to bring that up tomorrow. I'm going to remember that tomorrow. Uh, settlers take action is 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 the name of your project. And we'll get into the specifics of that and what that looks like. Trust me, you have an attentive audience here. Uh, but the word itself, settlers, uh, take us into to what how that word resonates with you, how you invoke that word. And, and do you agree? It, is it a slur? Is it not? How do you process it? Look, I'll be honest. I don't know how you hear the word settler. And in, and and personally, like I struggle with why that's a slur when the, the issue is how indigenous people have been treated. That's the conversation we should be having repivoting it to my feelings are hurt because it's a it's a slur um i get it like these things are hard to grab this is uncomfortable this conversation is uncomfortable to have in a public discourse but necessary if you don't grapple with it if you don't deal with it if you don't sit with that discomfort and 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 own that um then we keep doing the same thing and the same thing sucks the same thing has to change the status quo doesn't take care of everybody in this country um, and in order to see that change, we have to we have to deal with terms like a colonial nation and settler and white supremacy and how those things factor into our everyday lives uh, in this country. But that doesn't mean that the people are bad. That doesn't mean Canadians are bad. That doesn't mean that you know white folk are bad. It it just means that something needs to be done. And I think when you read our post, you'll see that we love this country. I love this country. I'm a I'm I I think. Canada is incredible, but I also know it's not perfect. And I also know that it needs to be better and that the status quo did not take care of all of us. And that was the past, but today and tomorrow and the future, we get to control that. We get to shape that if we take action. Um, yeah, and and I, I think I'll pause there, but I do have more to say. <laughs> you don't have to pause there, keep going. Oh um, yeah, I, I guess the other thing I'll say, you know, we we definitely oversimplified the term settler in our post and we're, we're working on a follow-up post there because it didn't really highlight the fact that there are um you know descendants of slaves that did not choose to come hmm. to this land 
Um, and there are people like my family. I was born in uh, Montreal, but my parents came here from Sri Lanka and they're, they're Tamil and Sri Lanka was colonized, but it wasn't a settler colony the the British left. And when they left, there was a civil war and there was oppression and, you know, there was so much going on in a lot of these countries that used to be colonies of, uh, like, of, of an empire, like the British Empire. Um, so I have a very complicated relationship with colonization as someone who, whose family and ancestors uh, were colonized. But then as a Canadian, as someone who lives here, I benefit from colonization. It's it's weird, but both can be true. Um and I think it's understanding that like it like just know that 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 the benefits that come with colonization don't mean and the privilege that comes with it doesn't mean that like it should all be taken away. It means addressing it so that everyone is experiencing that privilege, that it becomes a right as it's supposed to be. Um like I said, it's a great country, but it could be better. It could be doing better and it needs to. Hmm. The, the, you and what you're saying and this conversation is the whole reason for this show. For, for someone to say, I have a complicated relationship with this or I feel strongly about this, but I cannot ignore this or we must reconcile this. This makes me uncomfortable. This uh, That's the whole point. Um, I don't want to take us off into a rabbit hole. But I think I mean I'm listening to you about the word colonization and and a complicated relationship and how you I, I, and I was you know what popped into my mind another word capitalism I thought we could do a whole show on capitalism on how it's not the worst ever some people would come on and argue that it is uh, and many people would come on and champion capitalism and and I'm a big free market guy but at the same time do we acknowledge as well that capitalism has some real ugly nasty bits that require oversights and checks and balances and of of course. Uh, I don't want to take us into a rabbit hole and turn this into a talk on capitalism, but I think you, t- you understand what I'm saying. A hundred percent. I think, um, I don't know when it became, it had to be one or the other. Well, like we're not one or the other. My identity is not as simple as one thing. We have so many different facets about ourselves that of course that's true for everything else in our world and our systems, you know? Yeah. Um, I think the, like it's okay to have a divisive stance on things like, the habs and the leaves. It's not okay to take advice of stand on things that are related to human rights. Yeah. And I think in those situations, you can appreciate your privilege and you can understand it. And then you can want other people to have it. And I think what often happens is people hear the concept of privilege and they go, uh, you know, that's scary because I don't want to lose it. I, I don't want to give it away. Like, but it's not, it's not like if you lose your privilege, by giving it to, by making sure more people have it. Um, it's just inviting more of us to prosper. And that's in this country's best interest, like to move forward, to, to build a better country, to, to make a difference um, and leave the world a little bit better than we found it. We have to grapple with the fact that there are comp- nuance to this. You, the country, capitalism, so many issues, great in theory, aren't awesome in application, but that's okay. We can change that. Hmm. We can change those things. We just have to accept that it's not a perfect system and it has to be better. I stood the other day just in my own thought, uh, off the clock, so to speak, uh, just outside for a walk. And I was just watching this Canadian flag fly. And it's, it's always been this beautiful symbol to me because I associate it with beautiful things, right? Like Canada Day and Sidney Crosby scoring on Ryan Miller and we win the gold medal uh, and we all get to run around Robson Street or it's always been these wonderful emotions. And, and then and then part of me, um, the voice that I think is is loud and clear in millions of people's heads right now is also like this, this flag um, and the flag before it um, have also pro- probably been great triggers for people. And uh, that flag probably represents some pretty nasty things for people. And I've I touched on it yesterday just briefly, and I didn't get into it on purpose about how I've been wrestling with my own understanding of Canada and what it is. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, for me, one of the things that I've been able to, uh, I've, uh, you know, come to this conclusion uh, in an area where I, I think it's pretty difficult to come to conclusions right now on this story and what we're talking about, because, again, we're just at the beginning. We don't even have the understanding. You know, Joanne Saddleback said to us on Friday, we're, everyone wants to talk about reconciliation. She says, we're not done with the truth yet. Uh, and I acknowledge that. But one conclusion I've come to 
is that uh, in, in so many ways as, as our history, our collective history with residential schools and with the treatment of indigenous people and with many other things, Japanese internment camps and all of the things uh, for, you know, eugenics and forced sterilizations. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot um, in so many ways as that defines my Canada, our collective response to this present day can also contribute to define how we perceive Canada. And that's an opportunity for us. Um, that's one way yeah. that I'm that I'm at least able to wrap my mind around what's going on right now. Yeah, I mean, um, like that's that's I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I think um, that what Canada is is not is not written in stone. We get to shape it. We get to do. We get to actively engage in it. Um, and it's it really does come down to sitting with that discomfort. It comes to like we were saying that truth, sitting with that truth. Um, and knowing that it did something wrong, you know, and, and it, it messed up and it screwed up. And that's the past. We can't we can't check, change that, but we can acknowledge it. We can reconcile with it and then we can make sure it never happens again. But in order for it to never happen again, in order for there to be change, you have to understand that it happened. And that, I think, is where we want we're inviting people, you know, join me, join our team, join our join, join what we're trying to do in sitting with this discomfort. Um, let's get it. Let's get into the specifics, Samantha. I don't mean to cut you off. In fact, I want to hand the mic right back to you, but I, but I want our, our audience members to understand where to go. And if they want to be part of this, I mean, it's impossible to not be inspired, especially people watching on YouTube. that can see your eyes widen. When you talk about this, the enthusiasm and the commitment is, is palpable uh, on Canada project.ca is where people are going to go um, on Canada project.ca. You, you, you come to take action right across the top bar. You go to settlers, take action and, and then where do we go from here? Can you take us into this? Yeah. So if you scroll down, um, you know, we, we kind of talk about why this is our moment, why we got to do this, why we got to take action. Um, and then here you go. You see four really quick steps or, or a couple steps on like what you can do. Um, and I invite everybody to do that. Like, like this is this is our moment to shape, to do it differently to do things differently, to react differently. We know about it. We saw it. We, we, we understand what's going on. Um, now, what are you going to do about it? That's what I want to know. But what are people going to do with this outrage? Because it can't just, there are so many more schools. There's the foster care system and how Indigenous people are disproportionately affected by it. Uh, there's the ongoing missing and murdered Indigenous women. There's so much going on there. And I think sometimes we think of issues as like, well, if we're talking about this, that means like, okay, like what happens to this other issue I really care about? I care about climate change or I really care about, you know, um, uh, income and like poverty and like the jobs and the market. Why can't we do all of it? Like, why does it have to be one or the other? Why do like, does, I know that sometimes to people that sounds a little like, you know, naive or, or like, okay, like she's, you know, like how, how are we going to do that? But why not? Why not actually have all these areas dealt with? Why not actually make change? Um, there's there's leaders in these roles. There's there's people doing the work. There are communities ready to mobilize. Hmm. Um, but we have to also, as people, do that work too. And sorry, the, the one thing I'll say, the reason why we're inviting people to take that action um, and, and be outraged and be vocal about it um, is because... It took several days after 215 remains were found of children, indigenous children, for the flags to lower. And I just want to like sit with that for a second. For the flags to lower, that's not a budget decision. That's not a policy decision. That's not a consult and find experts and make sure. That's the bare minimum. And it took days and outrage from non-indigenous people to make a difference there. And that's what I think people have to sit with is that if it took that long for an action that is so easy to do, how long will it take to reconcile? How long will it take for the truth and reconciliation to happen? How long are we just going to let that keep going on? That's the part. That's the part that I keep sitting with where I'm like, how could they wait? And if they waited, what, what, a, what an indication of how this issue has been held, dealt with. I'm not okay with that. I want to see it dealt with differently. So let's do something with that. And 
And that's not this government. That's not this leadership. That's every government that has ever existed and dealt with indigenous issues. No one is doing it right. That's why they persist to this day. But we hear it now. We see it. Social media has given us this information. I mean, you know, and that's something that we say in our post. If you didn't know about this, I honestly, I personally, I'm not surprised and not offended by that because I think, you know, we, it was kept out of a lot of our education. I'm, I'm, I'm 30. I just turned 30. So uh, when I was in grade school, I was not taught about this. Um, and it's uncomfortable to learn about on your own. And it's hard because it's not easy to access information, but we've made it easy now by compiling this website and we can learn now, like just cause you didn't learn it in the past doesn't mean you can't learn it now, you know? Um, and I, I, I just want to, like, I just want people to feel that. And I want them to take action on that because it, this can't keep going on. Well, there's, and there's, there's an appetite, uh, that's such a weird st- I always use these you know, This is a live show I don't get to go back And reuse words But there's like a There's a There's a yearning There's a longing There's There's a trend Of Of stated Public commitment That people are making To learn more And to educate themselves And I haven't seen that In a long time I didn't see it When The The Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its its findings And its recommendations I didn't see it When people were testifying Across the country I didn't see it um, when, you know, I mean, I've, I've had multiple conversations with friends like Adam North Pagan, I think of the one of the co-founders of the, the Alberta 60s Scoop Society. I mean, it's these are not these have not it, it's not like all of a sudden. I mean, the, the number 215 is striking. And, and if you if you just Google 215 right now and don't put anything else, you'll you'll be the number. The number is resonating with people because we're picturing these are 215 names. These are 215 humans. These are 215 little kids that had parents and aunties and uncles and grandparents. And I mean, it's just so the number 215. But we knew the number 4100 before that. Which is the estimate I think that now everybody acknowledges is, is is probably low on the number of children that died in residential schools in the country. We knew forty one hundred. Why didn't forty one hundred resonate like two fifteen is resonating? I don't know. Maybe it's because people are thinking that that two hundred fifteen kids at one school. One guy wrote in to say to me, "That's only like two a year." I was like, "Where is it? Can you imagine if your child's school?" Boarding school or not had two deaths a year for like a hundred years. Would you ever send? You know, he said. He said, Ryan. You, let, me, let me. I mean, he said, you keep calling it a mass grave. I call it a cemetery. I mean, don't even get me started. Like if if if, if your dear old granny passes away and when you take her to the cemetery, they. they I, I don't mean to be dis. You know what? I'm not even going to go there. I'm not going to be disrespectful and characterize it. But mass unmarked graves are not do not deserve the dignity and the reverence of being described as cemeteries. No. You know, so Arnold right now, and I respect Arnold. He's one of our regulars, and I know Arnold doesn't come in trying to piss people off. But but he says, you know, settler is an odd term to refer to people born here. I'd be surprised if people relate to it or own it in a widespread way. Um, I think that I think that some people may avoid, you know, utilizing or, or invoking the phrase settler in their social media bios or, or anything else, probably because they perceive it to mean other things as well. In so many ways, as I don't mean to get too abstract, but people think if you put pronouns in your bio, you, you must also vote for a certain political party. And, you you know, and you, you probably think that that nobody should drive cars anymore. People people impose so many things on including things in their bios. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. I mean, if you ask, I mean, I come from a farming family, not me personally, no calluses on my hands, but, you know, farming families and proud farming families, not a shot against them. But, you know, Canadian farmers, producers, you know, you've been proudly saying my grandpa and my uncles, they settled here 110 years ago. You've been using the word for decades proudly. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants to back away from it. I mean, hey, even if this is making somebody uncomfortable, good. Let's make ourselves more uncomfortable. Let's force ourselves to reconcile with these types of things. I'm grateful that you're at least opening the door for people to have these conversations, Samantha. No, thank you. Thank you for creating space for this as well. I I, I, I don't understand the fear. I, I feel like I'm always looking for ways to be a better person. Why should that be different for our country? Why can't we... What's so scary about it being like, oh man, I messed that up before, but I'm going to do better now. I mean, I do that in my life all the time. 
so why is I, I I don't know I don't know what holds people back. I don't know what they're scared of because and 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 what what insecurities it's triggering to to be afraid of words like settler or to be afraid of to uh, that and then like centering yourself in this discussion as opposed to looking at the issue which is in the indigenous lives and treatment and historical and current issues that are going on here. Um, I think in part it's because people are like it's conversations about it's it's conversations about privilege. For example, Kim just wrote in and said privilege can multiply like love. There's enough to go around. If only we'd get over our prideful, selfish selves and do the work to expand our own privilege. I think that's a, a beautiful way to put it. Um, you know, people, you know, I mean, on a on a on a ground level, I think people are nervous about things like. You know, what's going to be taken away from them or how's their life going to change? I mean, you know, the, the city of Edmonton renaming its wards, its electoral wards. This will be the first municipal election under the new ward boundaries and people are having to learn new names and, and learn new pronunciations. And maybe that makes some people uncomfortable. I don't know. I mean, maybe people think I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know. I can't. We, learn- we learn new things all the time. You 100%. Phone, you have- Samantha, I mean, I mean, I mean, a hockey pool. Where I'll sp- I'll be up all night until three in the morning scouting videos of star seventeen year old players from Latvia and the Czech Republic, and I can say all their names. I've learned all their names. I can say Dreisaitl and Tverdovsky, and I can say names that are difficult to learn, but they roll off my tongue. It's no excuse. It's what we're willing to commit to. A hundred percent. I I totally agree, and, and I I think of it like this: like use your privilege. I felt privileged that I had an educational background that gave me the tools to explain and contextualize the pandemic. So I used it and I made an account. Um, privilege is not, you don't lose it by using it. In fact, I think it it is so important if you have privilege to use it, to give it to others, to help others, to support others, um, and to ensure that the system systemically fit, starts to shift so that you don't have to do that work, but the system is set up to do it for you. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, what, you know what also I think part of it is, is some people I think, and it, because I've seen it, people get defensive when the, when the word privilege is invoked, because I think they take it, per, they, they take it as an implication that, that they didn't work or that they, that they, that, that everything was handed to them on a silver platter, that they've had privilege. And I think people take it per, some people get really defensive about that. Yeah. I, so this is the thing that I, I, oh my gosh, I think about this all the time. I'm a woman of color. My parents immigrated here. There is intergenerational tra- trauma that from Sri Lanka and the war there. Um, and I, I like, I'm a woman, I'm a woman of co- color. I have mental health issues. Like, you know, there's so many things going on in my life that, that make me very complex, but I am very privileged. There are places I don't have privilege, but I'm privileged. I have a university education. I took a year off of my life to volunteer and start a project and got to move into my parents, like my bedroom, <laughs> like my childhood bedroom, because my parents could take care of me while I worked on this account. You know, like like you can you can work hard, you could be privileged and still be oppressed. You can um you could be, you know, a man who's white but low income or have a history of trauma in their family or issues in their family that affect them. Like, it's not, it's not like a, like a distinctive, like a column, B column, you know, there's a lot of overlap here. There's a lot of nuance because people are complicated, but that's, that's okay. Just like grapple with that, own that. Like I'm privileged. I have a a connection to talk to you right now. Um, People don't have that. I think it was was it Kwame Damon Mason Sarah that that had made the comment. We did a we did a roundtable, Samantha. Just uh, what was it like two Fridays ago? I think it was uh, something like that. And we, we were talking about barriers to sport. I think it was Kwame that made the comment, and and it and he said, um, you know, he's he's a black man. He's been doing amazing work uh, bringing hockey to different communities, telling the story of of hockey uh, greats from marginalized communities, and, and people should certainly check out his series Soul on Ice. Uh, Kwame's just a beautiful guy, but even in the middle of that conversation he's talking about how uh, you know there's you know uh, you know black hockey stars and players have been dealing with racism through the decades and through the years and then he says but i have privilege kwame says i have i'm, I'm a male i have privilege he says i'm able-bodied i have privilege <laughs> and it was just as he's saying and i'm going wow and he's saying this on the heels of how how horrific uh, some of this racism has been toward black athletes and i just to me when he made that comment it freed everybody up at least i hope it did 
to start to have those introspective moments themselves, you know, and to, and to be able to have those honest and open conversations. I respect and I love that you're doing it. I want to read a couple comments here and I want to circle back on something you told us about how your your team's working to broaden or expand your writing, your post on on settlers taking action. Um, Fatima is watching and says settler is she says it's such an uncomfortable term for me. As a Palestinian woman, she says, my people are being oppressed by settler colonialism as I type. I'm a settler, though, and a guest on Turtle Island, and I do benefit from that. I mean, that she, she almost sort of in her own way uh, mirrors what you're saying. I also saw, I love that Sika Sings is watching this morning live. She's tuning in live on YouTube. Uh, check out Sika Sings on Instagram, everybody. She's doing amazing work, like um, t- storytelling with children, and she's a wonderful musician, and, and I just have a lot of respect for her. She says, thank you um, for this conversation, Samantha. She says, on my dad's side, I'm a settler, and on my mom's side, I descend from enslaved people. And she says, complicated is the right word. When, when you noted that your team's going to, further its its exploration and its writing and its post on on settlers taking action etc and you noted that uh several people um I, I think back to feature reports that i've done in conversations about descendants from amber valley in alberta that might be one example people that descended from slaves um is that based on somebody reaching out to you or individuals reaching out to your group or was that a, a result of your deep dive or how did that come about so a bit of both i think um So just for context, the account had about 15,000 followers that we had like steadily been building a community. Um, And then overnight, it was like, like in two nights, it was, we were very grateful to have like 80,000 people in total and like overwhelmed a little bit. But um, when we put those posts out, the intent was just, you know, to mobilize people to take their individual responsibility in reconciliation and in standing solidarity with Indigenous people um, and to not let this conversation stop with just the government and Indigenous folk. But we knew that, like, as we posted it, we were like, oh, there's so much nuance around it. There's so much nuance around it. But we wanted to get it out as we were learning, as we were doing the work. Um, and we had started working on a post to, uh, to, to sort of, you know, talk about if you've been colonized back in the country you came from and now you you know benefit from colonization what is your responsibility here if you're if you've been human trafficked what's your responsibility if you're a descendant of a person who was enslaved like what's what's your responsibility here um and why that's different from someone who's descending from colonizers uh um, but how we all still benefit from that. So that's something we had started exploring. Again, volunteer teams, so it takes time. It's also a heavy subject. It's emotionally yeah. exhausting labor to go through. Um, but we started working on it. And then someone brought, like, messaged my personal Instagram account being like, hey, I'm really disappointed in this post. And she she put, she put said some stuff and she shared a link to uh, uh, someone else who would, I can't remember the, the handles, but... Uh, that had said, you know, don't follow this account. They, they screwed up. They look what they wrote here is wrong. They're leaving out all these other people from it. And, you know, we put so much work into that. We put so much work. And for someone to say that, I was like, yeah, that's true. That's hundred percent true. We did not get explain it well enough. So how do we explain it better? Um, how do we do better now that we know better? So uh, now that's, that, that came from someone having a conversation. I had a zoom call with her this morning, talking to her about it um, and asking, like asking her to help me understand that. So um, seek to understand. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't literally say it every morning when I look in the mirror, but in a way um, I don't literally have it tattooed on me, but I, but I should seek to understand. I just think that that's just such, that's the best advice I've ever received. Um, and, and I commend you for that. I, 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 I just looked at the clock and I realized we've kept you here for almost an hour, uh, which was not our intent. I'm so grateful. This is what happens. We're just having a good, meaningful conversation. The yeah. audience, the audience is all over this. I know that this podcast is, is going to move because, um, these are exactly the types of conversations that people are wanting to have. I will note this to Beaver. I've never met to Beaver. I look forward to when I can. Um, and, and, and I only know that they have identified uh, themselves as indigenous in our chat before so from that perspective to beaver asks are you a colonizing settler or are you a treaty partner um i know that treaty partner sure sounds a whole lot better 
Um, <laughs> but I don't want to take the easy road out, but I've never even heard that before. I, re- I really, um, Sam's letting me know that two beaver is Dene. Okay. I appreciate that. That background, uh, team approach here. Good stuff, Sam. Uh, and thanks to two beaver for chiming in. I'm going to do some reading today on, on what treaty partner means and, and, um, not, not to absolve ourselves of, of the discomfort around some of the other labels or acknowledgements, but that's an interesting question to ask as well. Uh, Samantha, I'm so grateful for the work that you and, of course, that your team has been doing. Uh, people can find you online again at oncanadaproject.ca, and you can follow all the social media handles as well, as mentioned, as tens of thousands of other people have done. Samantha Krishna Pillay, thank you so much for your time here on Real Talk. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. What a great perspective. And thank you to the Real Talkers that are keeping these comments going. I'm going to be honest, uh, and I know Sarah Hoyles is on top of all of it. I haven't even, I've been trying to keep on top of the live chat and and engaged in conversation with her. I haven't even looked at her hashtag yet. I bet you that's blowing up right now as well. And I, and I know it will too later when more and more people are downloading the podcast. Real Talk RJ, our hashtag is powered by the team at Park Power. And at parkpower.ca right now, they want to remind you that if you bring your internet, electricity, natural gas business over to them, commercial or residential, it's easy to do online. Just follow the step-by-step tutorial. If you use the promo code 2021-REALTALK, they're going to give you $70 off your first bill. No strings attached at parkpower.ca, where they take 10% of their profits and put them back into the non-profits in the communities where they live and work. You know, we're so grateful to partner with the team at Friesen Brothers. Congratulations to them. They've just opened their 16th Alberta location. Congratulations to Sundry Alberta. This is a remarkable story. I mean, literally, they rebranded that grocery store overnight. And yesterday it opened up in Sundry. I know, Sundry, you've been asking for this. Well, Friesen Brothers is there. And over the next number of days and weeks, you're going to see them rolling out all the favorites like those cinnamon buns and the, the braised beef short ribs and everything else. Their famous sourdough bread. You know, the items that people have been coming to Friesen Brothers for more than 65 years to pick up. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Also, big shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. We've been talking to them personally. We're trying to get our dream turned into reality. And and Mike's like, absolutely, buddy. You guys will love to hear this, too, though. But he's like, you don't jump the queue, pal. He's like, we've been talking to people for months about turning their dreams into reality and all their crews are pedal to the metal right now. Mike is hard at work drafting up the plans, working with their clients and customers to make sure they get it right. Check this out at landscapeedmonton.ca. This is just the first picture I came across. This, a beautiful pergola, right, Sam? A pergola. That is most Look at that. Isn't that fabulous gorgeous. with the multi-tiered fitted stone? The big boulders? I have boulder envy. I have boulder envy on every yard that I see that has boulders. It's no joke. Hey? You get the big picker truck comes up and then, oh. the, and then they get the big boulder on the front lawn and I like the people that put the house numbers into the boulder, maybe some I, lighting I wa- around yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I wanted to do that, and then I realized I didn't have the stuff to move a boulder, so I well, put Sam, my address on a, on a wooden post, but uh, if Eden can hook me up with a boulder... That's where I was going to say, you we go to landscapeedmonton.ca, and then the next thing you know, you you know get rid of your boulder envy. That could be another one of the billboards that we voluntarily provide them the messaging for. You can find the team at Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. Are we ready to rock with our uh, with our Yale connection here? All right, this is here we are. Now let's just recognize. Let's let's talk straight. There are some difficult conversations that are happening this week, and they're important conversations. We're going to keep having them. That's, we know that that's why you're here. We know you're also here at the odd time to have a little bit of fun, to relax, to take a breath. And you knew that this was coming. You knew that when we brought in the organizers, the founders of the Edmonton International Cat Festival and spent half an hour extolling the virtues of cats, celebrating cats and who they are to their human partners, to their employees, as some of you put it, you just knew that we were going to take some time to talk about dogs. Did you know that there is an Ivy League connection here? Did you know that potentially your dog could head to the Ivy League? I'm talking about Yale and Yale's dog lab zachary silver is a a phd candidate in comparative psychology at yale university the yale university at the canine cognition center he's exploring how domestic dogs think and reason when it comes to the world around them zachary welcome to real talk and thanks for making time for us 
My pleasure. Happy to be here. Did you grow up? Are you are you a dog guy? Are you a cat guy? Are you an animal guy? What what was your upbringing like in the context of house pets? I'm certainly a dog person. Absolutely. Um, definitely grew up around dogs. And I think that uh, my passion for researching dogs was really born out of being around some wonderful dogs throughout my life. So I was lucky enough to be with dogs who just seemed to be exceedingly intelligent. I got interested about understanding well, what is it about these dogs that makes them so intelligent. Um, you know, fast forward to today and I spend you know every day studying that. So it's really a wonderful course of action for me. Was it was it for you? I mean, you, you note the intelligence of the dogs that you grew up around. Um, was there also kind of did you perceive there to be uh, an intelligence in, in, on different fronts? I mean, like there's the intelligence that would come with with, uh, you know, r- competing in different events, you know, chasing down a Frisbee and catching it before it lands versus the intelligence of 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 sniffing out and finding someone, maybe a search and rescue dog versus emotional intelligence as an example the the whole kind of lassie idea i mean did you see different contexts i love the way that you frame that question because when we talk about dog intelligence we really are asking a question of not like how smart dogs are but really in what ways dogs are smart Mm. Uh, so we know because of dogs domestication history that they spent uh, the early part of their existence really being shaped by humans we were looking for certain features in dogs we we're actively selecting for that in the populations of dogs that we took into our camps allowed to have the protection from environmental threats and we shared our food with so the modern domestic dog is a dog that understands humans very very well as a result what we see is that dogs are a species who is um, tremendously skilled in understanding human social communication. So what you describe as like the Lassie effect, this emotional intelligence, dogs are picking up on everything that we do. They're very vigilantly attending to us, constantly watching our behavior and looking for subtle social signals. And they use these to determine how they should interact with us. They latch onto the smallest details and they're keen observers of human behavior. The result is that they come across as being incredibly emotionally intelligent, understanding our social signals, our emotional states, but also working with us collaboratively in those contexts that you described, like scent detection and, and even as service animals. The so dogs really seem to have this unique skill set that derives from their domestication history that enables them to be so savvy in all of these social matters. Yeah, you talk about the domestication history. I'm so, literally my next question to you is so so was this developed? Was this bred? I mean, is is it true? My, my understanding is that that, that every essentially every dog like every domesticated dog descends in theory at least anyway from the wolf uh and the dogs have been bred from wolves is that is that true can you take us into the history and how dogs picked up some of the the qualities that they exude the qualities you're studying that is absolutely true so all dogs today are descendants from the gray wolf that's their most recent common ancestor Uh, so we think our our best estimate of when domestication began was about forty thousand years ago at this time, there were a population of wolves that seemed to be just more tolerant of humans. They were willing to approach us and, and weren't scared of us, but also importantly, didn't want to attack us and you know, try to be a, a predator to us. Um, this resulted in early evolving humans uh, simply allowing dogs to interact with us in our camps. And we shared our food with them. We kept them safe from the harsh environments we, they may have lived in. So these dogs, these evolving wolves and early dogs, that seemed to be more tolerant of humans had the advantage of human protection. They were then more likely to survive and reproduce. So with every subsequent generation, these dogs became more and more human tolerant because that became something that they had an evolutionary pressure to have. This tolerance for humans initially was the driving force behind determining which wolves were surviving and which were not. So as we started to distinguish between dogs and wolves, we almost created two separate species here that were just the tolerant ones and the intolerant ones. Uh, Then a second really interesting thing happened, which is that we started to want to work collaboratively with these early dogs. It wasn't enough anymore for them to just hang out with us and live and kind of be a freeloader. We needed them to have a more symbiotic and cooperative relationship. So we allowed these dogs to then start hunting with us, working in this collaborative context which dramatically increased both our success as humans and their success as early dogs. So this relationship exists today now. So throughout all of this time, dogs have been selected for and bred to be more and more tolerant of us, but also skilled in understanding our communication. One of the very foundational abilities dogs have is to understand our um, communicative signals. So this comes in two really important forms. One is that they can match where we are looking. So we call this our eye gaze. If I just like turn to the left and look this way, Uh, my dog will know I should direct my attention that way. So they follow our eyes better than any species. 
Uh, importantly, the second feature of this is that they can follow our pointing gestures. So if I give a pointing cue over this way, dogs will direct their attention there immediately. Now, this was really important to working in this very first collaborative context, which was hunting, uh, where we could effectively signal what we wanted dogs to do, and they could pick up on this instantaneously and follow us. So the dogs who were the best hunters then had that advantage of we wanted to keep those around. Um, and now working forward in time, we see all these other contexts in which dogs are also um, we mandate that they are able to uh, understand their signals. Um, and that's why the modern dog, all of them, uh, have this keen ability to understand our communicative signals and intents. This is fat. I could listen to you talk for six hours, by the way. Uh, are you so are you talking about are you getting like you go to the Westminster dog show and you take only the best in show and the best in class and you're taking the smartest, most expensive, most pedigreed dogs in the world at Yale or or which dogs are you studying? How do dogs qualify? It's actually quite the opposite. So we're looking for the average dog. We want it's like you at home, like and you're like, I have a dog, bring your dog in, have your dog come to the Ivy League. Because that's what we're trying to do when, when we're studying dogs here at Yale. We want to understand dogs broadly. Um, so we do sometimes do experiments where we're looking at specialized populations, dogs that really do have high levels of training. With those studies, we're looking to see the role of training in, in particular. Most of the time when we're studying dogs, we're looking for this broad sample that is really diverse and represents all dogs. Um, so with that in mind, your dog does not need to have any prior training or really any specialized abilities. Really, we just ask that dogs are rough, generally friendly towards humans and won't pose any risk to, to our experimenters in the lab. Are you uh, uh, when, when it comes to rescue dogs and, and I recognize that you can't characterize all uh, rescue dogs uh, sort of with with, you know, oh, these are the traits of a rescue dog because you may have. Uh, you know, dogs that, you know, maybe mama didn't get spayed and all of a sudden they've got beautiful puppies that, that may happen to be from two papered parents and, and, and technically they're rescues, but people get their hands on it. And then you may have dogs that have been uh, abused or malnourished or, you know, dogs that have been bred for fighting or I mean, obviously there's many different circumstances. Um, but what do you know about dogs that may have had complicated or even abusive experiences and how that shapes or forms how they perceive humans. Uh, ha have, you, have you been able to look into that? So to date, there is minimal research on this. And I will say there's much more that we don't know than that we do. Um, but the research that does exist to this point suggests that the general cognitive profile of a dog will per uh, persevere even in the context of, of abusive past or these difficult upbringings. Um, these types of social savviness that I'm describing here seem to be extremely hardwired into a dog's biology. Uh, and given the right environment, they'll express themselves even if that doesn't happen early in life. Um, one really interesting study on this shows that dogs form attachments to humans just like human children do to their primary caregivers. And they did sample rescue dogs here that had been abused. And they found that those dogs were just as quick to form attachments to their new caregivers as puppies were when they were meeting their um, you know, first caregivers for the first time. We have so many questions from audiences, you might expect. I love this from Donna. She, I don't know if she's serious or not. She says, working with dogs all day would be a dream job. Can I work there for free? I don't know if you're accepting humans to Yale. Are you seriously uh, accepting people's dogs? Like if, if somebody is watching this in, in Winnipeg or Vancouver or, or Thunder Bay and they want to send their dog down to Yale or they want to go down there, I mean, are you literally accepting dogs to participate in this study? Absolutely. So at the moment, our lab is still closed due to COVID protocols, but we do anticipate we'll be opening back up in the very near future. Um, so we always have dogs, caregivers come with them into the lab. So we would need you to physically come down to New Haven and, and visit us there. But we, we'd be happy to have you. Uh, we, we'd love to see you come into the lab. For more information, you can go to doglab.yale.edu. Uh, it's our, our website and there's information about how you can get involved. Um, I will say in the short term, we are um, planning to launch some studies that are going to be running on Zoom. Uh, this is a, sort of a, a new development for us, so uh, we're still working out the kinks of this a little bit. Um, but our, our plan is to be able to test um, individuals and dogs and families all over the country. Uh, so this is something that maybe if you live farther away in Canada is maybe more accessible than making the trip to New Haven. Though I, I certainly encourage you to, to make the trip down. New Haven's lovely. We have great pizza and we'd love to learn more about your dog in the process. Well, yeah, I mean, and there's yeah, yeah, sure. That's fine. Um, I'm more concerned. Like, do we get. When I say we, um, do participants get uh, some sort of certificate that would mimic at, at a at a distance that would mimic some sort of a degree 
from Yale. And would the stuff about the dog lab, would that be in very small print? And in other words, may I receive some paperwork that I could use to mislead everyone that would come into my office at some time? I'm not sure how long you'll be able to keep up the bruise, but you will get a piece of paper that resembles a degree. There is a like dog degree progression. Yes. We have um, uh, some of our most dedicated dogs have, have achieved all kinds of interesting degrees. Uh, you know, we progress them through a, a bachelor degree program all the way through a master's and a, a dog PhD program. Yes. Are, of course, not real degrees. Um, with that in mind, though, at first glance, I don't think anybody would notice that it's not a real Yale degree. They'd probably have to like, examine it pretty closely to realize this is coming from the dog lab. This is all <laughs> I need to hear, my man. This is all I need to hear, Zachary. I'm in. Uh, I can't wait. I'm very much looking forward to it. Ultimately, how do you see this? Uh, I mean, this is such a fascinating area of study for you. Um, you're a PhD candidate, as mentioned, at Yale in comparative psychology. How, how do you ultimately, and this may be too premature to ask, but I would imagine you have some sort of a, of a hypothesis or what would the application, where do you, where do you forecast the application being here specifically? There are a couple interesting outcomes that we hope to achieve through studying dogs. The first is that we can actually use dogs to understand humans better. Uh, this is sort of the general aim of comparative cognition. We try to isolate which aspects of the human mind are unique and then which might be shared either amongst our close social relatives like dogs or amongst our close genetic relatives like other non-human primate species, uh, chimpanzees or bonobos. So we study other animals to try to search for what makes us unique as humans uh, as opposed to what things might have been um, you know, a product of social, social environment or culture. A lot of times things that we think might be uniquely human, uh, for instance, for a long time, the ability to follow these pointing cues was thought to be uniquely human. And we discovered that dogs do this as well. Um, so we can infer from that that that's maybe not something that was you know, just some hallmark of human cognition, but instead maybe something that is a product of our culture or social environment. Um, so that's sort of the, the primary goal is that we can use dogs to better understand humans. And the second and equally important goal here is that we can improve our relationships with dogs by understanding them better. The more we learn about dogs, the more we're able to fine tune the way that we interact with dogs, the way that we train dogs and the way that we exist in a shared social environment with dogs. Uh, dogs are sort of unique in the fact that we are a part of their natural environment at this point, post domestication, you know, the dogs cannot live without us. Like we, we've um, tied ourselves to dogs in a inseparable way. Um, so, and we can continuously refine how we interact with, with these dogs how we make their lives enriching and beneficial, and also how we can get the most out of that experience as humans as well. Uh, one tangent in that is that we, we know that the role of dogs in a working capacity, that service animals and scent detection, all of these uh, avenues to which dogs work with us, they're really important for a lot of people. Um, and the more we understand about how dogs learn and reason about the social world, the better we can equip dogs to perform those roles. Are, are dogs uh, judgmental? Do, do do dogs perceive when uh, perhaps they're not receiving excellent care or when a human being is falling short of the standards of care or not being a great friend? Uh, do dogs understand that type of thing? Is there a, I guess what I'm asking, is there a blind loyalty or no? This is actually right in the area that I'm most excited about in the research field right now is I'm looking to understand how dogs make judgments about humans. Um, so we're not looking specifically at if dogs feel like they're not receiving good care. That would be a, a little bit of an ethical dilemma from a research standpoint to put dogs in that situation. But what we are manipulating is we can show dogs different types of people that behave in dichotomous ways. For instance, someone who's nice and someone who's mean. And we just wa have dogs watch them interact with other humans. So dogs are not even involved in these interactions. They're just watching someone who is being nice, someone who's being mean. Uh, my favorite experiment in this uh, area is that I'm trapped in a little cage and I'm trying to reach for a clipboard that's outside of the cage. And a very nice person walks up to the clipboard and they hand it to me. Uh, other times they see me reaching for a different clipboard and a very mean person comes and pulls the clipboard farther away from me. And so dogs have no reason to care about a clipboard and they're meeting me for the first time too. So they really don't have much of a reason to care about me. But after seeing this, dogs seem to prefer this nice person. Um, and this is really interesting because this is a very important facet of human cognition that we can observe social interactions and then decide how we should interact with those people enables us to choose good social partners and avoid people that might be harmful to us. Um, this is also something that we thought may have been uniquely human, but we're seeing really interesting evidence for this in dogs now. Mashif on our live chat says, I I I've always said 2020 was the best year ever for my dogs. So many people have reconnected with their animals. Hey, I mean, and with their and with their. Oh, yeah. And by the way, also their family and things like that. But uh, for a lot of people have spent way more time with their their house pets, dogs included than than at any other time, probably in, in, in that relationship's history. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say 2020 has been a great year for the dog um, um, in, in, in a couple of capacities. One, I think a lot of people who thought maybe dogs aren't for me took the chance on, on adopting a dog and you know have now been receiving that benefit of a, a really important relationship that's, you know, giving a dog a home and, and you know, giving a, a human a great companion. But also even people that have had dogs for a long time. Uh, we're seeing this really uh, important surge in in the way that dogs and humans are connected. I've noticed this in my pets as well. Um, it just seems like we're closer than we used to be because we've been spending all this time together. And this actually is uh, an evolutionary story that makes a lot of sense given dogs' history. Um, you know, we spent all of our time with dogs in their early evolutionary history. We, you know, worked alongside them and we were tied to them, you know, for basically 24 hours a day. Um, you know, modern society has pulled us apart from from our pets a little bit, but uh, 2020 allowed us to maybe make that connection again. I hope that people continue to spend as much time as they can with their dogs because they will recognize how important it can be to, um, you know, foster that relationship. Uh, Jillian makes a, a good observation I want to ask you about and also has a, a question. I don't know if she's serious or not. If she is serious and you give us a serious answer, I'm going to go online to the Yale shop right away. She's wondering if Yale makes doggy sized shirts and hoodies so that pups can show their Yale pride. Everybody's seen the Yale hoodie. You probably have one. Zachary, do they make ones for dogs? I don't believe they make the hoodie okay. itself for dogs. There are a couple of dog accessories, though. There's a dog leash. There's a dog collar. I think it's something go. that we need to we need to step up our game on a little bit. Though. Well, we I need think to get some more, more you know, dog merchandise. <laughs> bu- bumper stickers like "Proud Puppy Parent of a Yale Graduate." Uh, that's one that I would smack on my rig, no problem. Uh, Jillian goes on though to point out, and I don't know if this is your area of study or not. Um, she says though, and I've heard this before, dogs are amazing. At detecting disease she says before mris uh a lot of times nurses back in the day would have dogs on the ward and they would honestly help detect things like infections tumors um i've heard anecdotal stories about dogs in palliative care units um that i mean it's sad but it's real life the the dog kind of knows who's you know in, who's going to expire and the dogs will go and curl up next to people and be with those people for their last breath. There's something about the intuition or do we just impose this on them? Is this just what as humans we want to believe to be true? This is a really interesting question. And there actually is some evidence to suggest that dogs can detect uh, some diseases. Um, these are diseases that tend to be characterized by a particular olfactory scent. So um, dogs can actually smell the onset of symptoms, the onset of a disease. Um, this is a, a great example of like dogs work in the scent detection roles because they have such an acute sense of smell way beyond our own. Um, and they're very good at communicating that to us when they smell certain things. So they obviously have to be trained to do this, but it's the same process by which a dog might work um, in scent detection to detect explosive devices. They can also be trained to signal the detection of certain patterns in the symptomatic uh, expression of diseases. Um, even in modern technology, this is something that dogs can still do effectively. A lot of individuals uh, with certain conditions will actually have a service animal whose job it is to detect you know, certain uh, patterns of expression in a disease they might have. You know, for instance, um, diabetes dogs have become very common. They can detect low insulin levels and alert their human to that, that um, presence. Yeah, I even, uh, this is anecdotal again. I, I was just the other day out walking the dogs. My dogs never do this. We, we have a boxer and a lab. And I was walking past a guy on the sidewalk and they like hackled and my boxer started to get a bit snarly, which is is a sight on its own. And uh, and they never do that. And I kind of wondered, like, honestly, it was all the evidence I needed to see. You could never arrest somebody based on that evidence. But for me, I'm like that. That just felt like that. That person might have been a bad dude. I don't know. There's something about dogs. There's something about dogs. They just they can sense it. Right. I have a feeling that you're right about this. I think that dogs have a really intuitive sense of, of who's, you know, who's nice and who's not nice. I think my research you know, shows that if we actually show dogs who's nice and who's not nice, they can track this information. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see, you know, what dogs are latching onto in these short interactions where, you know, maybe they don't have good information that we have. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, dogs are, uh, like I mentioned before, they're observing really small signals of behavior. So it may have just been as simple as like, your dog wasn't a fan of this person's body language, but maybe that body language is a signal of, of something else. Um, so I think you know the role of us understanding what dogs are telling us is another really important frontier of communication. We know a real lot about um, how we communicate with dogs and maybe a lot less about how dogs communicate with us. 
Uh, so I think that's something that as psychologists we need to look into in the future. We need to figure out a way to understand dogs' communication that they're producing as opposed to communication that they're receiving. Hmm. Miranda says she's looking to pick up a, a, to get a dog to help her with her day to day. Says her fibromyalgia is getting worse. Uh, Tracy says she follows a woman on YouTube who has a migraine detection dog. Fascinating. Laura, meantime, says this conversation is hilarious to me because I'm terrified of dogs and I can't even be in the same room as them. Do you have a Do you have a message to Can, can you preach to the unconverted? Do you consider yourself to be a dog advocate? You have to be considering what you're doing i'm certainly certainly a dog advocate yeah. absolutely um I, I i think uh you know a fear of dogs is common you know they are they are an animal and if you're if you're afraid of of you know something that is you know scary in that sense like it's understandable so I, you know don't force yourself to to get a dog if, if it's not for you but uh, if you think it might be uh, i do encourage you to give it a chance um, a lot of dogs are you know very very sweet creatures they they really just love being around us uh, maybe it's just a matter of finding the right dog for you. So um, I would encourage you to maybe maybe dip your toes into that water, like hang out with some some dogs that you know and can, and maybe trust that your friends own or something of that nature. Uh, work your way up to maybe spending time alone with a dog, and eventually I think you'll find that you know dogs are for you. I think dogs are for everybody. Yeah, you, you just, <laughs> just you just got to stay away from the dogs statistically that bite. More than any others. And of course, we know we're talking about dachshunds and chihuahuas, the real vicious ones. <laughs> Statistically, it's true. People look it up. Christina yeah, says the, those yeah. are those small dogs. They really, uh, really yeah, a handful. <laughs> absolutely. They are. They have to be. Christina says my dog was super friendly to the dude that broke into my yard a couple of years ago. She thinks that everybody is good. So there you go. The dogs that can find the good in everybody. Zachary, before we thank you for your time and let you get back to your research at the Yale Dog Lab, uh, we put you in an admittedly very unfair position right now. Um, w- when I admit to you that that based on the, the the depth of field here and the perspective, I'm having a hard time of determining whether or not that's a cello or a bass behind you, but it's a beautiful instrument. Uh, can, can you take Is this something that you play proficiently? Yes, uh, this is a bass. Um, I actually, in addition to studying psychology as an undergraduate student, I was also a music major where I, I studied jazz performance. <laughs> okay, so do you happen to, you know where this is going, uh, do you happen to have, do you call it a bow? You don't call it a bow. What do you call it? Like you're, you know, the thing. Do you have the thing with you? Uh, so there, there is a bow back there, but as, as a jazz player, I actually typically don't use the bow when I play as jazz. Of course, usually it's pluck, a right? based production. Yeah. 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 Would, would it would it be inappropriate for me to ask if you might just sort of riff a little bit and 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 send uh, us on our I'd way? Be with, happy to. We we would love to hear it. If you need thirty seconds or a minute, I can buy you the time. Uh, that's no problem for sure, you to get that, set up. Sam, why don't we do that? Um, why don't we? <laughs> I mean, like as if we're letting Zachary get away. It's like we have a, a Yale jazz major on the show talking about dogs. Um, yeah, just like uh, just like every other boring radio show in Canada right now, right? We're talking to Yale dog researchers that are going to play their uh, play the bass for us and play a little jazz just another boring episode of real talk i see people on the on the chat that are saying hey but yale's got courses you can take online and yale's got all kinds of cool things you can do Uh, jespo if you need that degree on your wall and it reminded me you know who else has courses online you know who else has great opportunities for you to learn a little bit more better your skill set prepare yourself for for a job market that's that's getting set to rebound from what's been obviously a difficult year it's power ed Powered by Athabasca University. We talked to you about powered.ca several times a week. Of course, you know, short online on demand professional development courses. It's leading edge and it's flexible, which is entirely the point. If you check them out online right now at powered.ca, you'll see how you can sign up right now today, even by this afternoon, complete courses in areas like leadership and digital wellness and allyship and inclusion. We've got a feature coming up on that, by the way. Project management. AI, machine learning, even things like digital wellness. Just like our conversation with the psychotherapist out of New York yesterday. Digital Wellness 101. Optimizing your time and energy. Learn more, sign up, even complete it today. Your convenience at powered.ca. Do we have Zachary Silver ready to rock and roll? All right, Zachary. We're so excited about this. You don't you don't happen to have a dog in the room. Is your dog in the room at the same time? Do you have a captive live audience? Oh, my dog is not in the room with okay. me, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, well, hey, uh, we're going to hand this over to you. We can't wait to hear it. This is a highlight already. It hasn't even happened yet. Thank you. 
Amazing. We're starting to lose our signal just a tiny little bit, Zachary, but that is absolutely fantastic. You have knocked our socks off. You have gone above and beyond, much like our canine companions do for us every single day. Thanks so much for being here with us today, my man. Congratulations on the amazing work that you're doing at Yale, and we'll follow up on this. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You bet. That's absolutely fantastic. That's Zachary Silver. I love that, Sarah Hoyles, when, when you booked that segment. I suspect you did not anticipate that we were going to get a live jazz performance at the end. What if I said I did? You did. You set it all up. I did. In your questions, you sent them ahead of time. Hey, you don't happen to be sort of like a classically trained jazz musician, do you, by any chance? Yeah. Exactly. That I'm, I mean, you hired me for a reason. <laughs> this, could be, Ryan. this could be what we ask our guests to do on a daily basis. Sure, you're an expert in this, but what else can you do to <laughs> impress us? This is, a, this is an audience that's going to continue to elevate its expectations. And uh, hey, we're here for it all day. We wanted to remind you as well, the teams at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, they reached out to me. Michelle did the other day. She sent me an email and um, I, I could almost kind of like hear her laughing through the typing. She was like, hey, Rye, um, so real talkers really like the peanut buster parfaits? <laughs> and I went, yeah, tell me something I don't know. Uh, our, e- our email inbox and my Twitter mentions are full of photos of peanut buster parfaits with like their, their rich, creamy, soft serve. And oh, I've, no, but it Two is. Two days in a no, row. No, but it's not. No, but it is. It, it is rich and creamy. That, that doesn't mean that you can't also use the same adjectives when it comes to discussing the rich, rich hot, hot fun. What was the other word that you wanted me to use that everybody wanted me to use for the peanut buster parfaits? Creamy vanilla soft serve is what they want. Creamy vanilla soft serve. And then the rich hot fudge. And of course, the peanuts as well, topped off with Dairy Queen's trademark curl and red spoon. So here's the deal. We've been telling you, and we were not lying. It was true at the time that that was their special for the month of May. But by popular demand which just means that they're probably making millions of dollars right now. They're going to continue for the rest of this week. The Real Talk Peanut Buster Parfait Special, which means they're $1.99 each. That's two for $4.20. Taxes in at the Dairy Queens in Newcastle, Nemeo, Palisades, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. The team at Westworld Computers wants to remind you that their service teams, like, yeah, yeah, their sales teams have been at it for 40 years, family-owned, but so have their service teams, which means they've seen it all. Anything that Apple's released They've worked on it. They know how to fix it, get it back to optimum operating condition. You can book your appointment today at westworld.ca. And and if they recommend and if you agree that it's time to upgrade at no charge, they'll transfer the data from your previously loved unit to your brand spanking new one. You can find them online. They'll ship anywhere via westworld.ca. Also, big shout out to the teams at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. I absolutely loved our conversation yesterday on electric vehicles. And a few of you reached out and said, hey, you, you said you drove that Wrangler 4xe. What was it like? I was telling you, yes, I had an opportunity. They've got at least one at St. Albert Dodge when I was there the other day. It's like the classic Jeep Wrangler, that classic beautiful rig, except for you, you don't even hear it. It's fascinating. And let me just say, and I was in a parking lot, so I didn't go too wild. But when you stomp on it, it gets you where you need to go quick. That's kind of one of the things we're going to have to wrap our minds around with EVs, the efficiency and the, the performance. You don't, you're not taking a hit on the performance side, which I know uh, Jeep drivers and uh, Jeep Nation cares about. You won't find a better uh, selection of Jeep in the province of Alberta than you will at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. You know, we partner, of course, every single week with our friends at Y Station. They're, by definition, they are our official research and strategy partners, and they present our question of the week every week. And I wanted to draw your attention to this one. Our question of the week, uh, which we authored with the team at Y Station following the racist remarks that were aimed at Edmonton Oilers defenseman Ethan Bear, a proud indigenous uh, defenseman, a hockey player, one of those in the National Hockey League whose career, of course, has inspired so many people. I don't have to tell you the Edmonton Oilers exited earlier than they would have liked from the playoffs. And people, these brave online commentators, started coming at Ethan Bear based on his ethnicity, based on his community of origin. And so we ask you in our question of the week this week at RyanJesperson.com, after the Oilers' first round elimination by the Jets, Ethan Bear, a member uh, of the Ochipues Nation, one of the most vig- visible indigenous players in the NHL, the target of racist comments online. Uh, of course, it did spark a flood of support 
from fans, from fellow players. Connor McDavid was vocal about it. The National Hockey League itself, and of course, many citizens and hockey fans. Now, it goes without saying, but still we say it. The teams at Real Talk, Ryan Jesperson, and Y Station Communications and Research condemn these types of hateful attacks against anyone and will stand against racism of any kind. We cannot, though, deny that racism is a presence in sport and that it's hard to be an athlete of color or a gay or lesbian or trans or queer athlete in any sport. We want to gauge what you see as the scale of the problem, and we want to know what you see as the solutions. It'll take you just two or three minutes to complete it. We'd be grateful if you would take two or three minutes out of your day today, maybe as soon as we go off air to complete that. You can find it again right at the top of the page at ryanjesperson.com. And per usual, early next week, we will review the results of that survey, hopefully with more than 1,000 people chiming. And that's about typically where we get, which is a great sample size. And of course, just a reminder, our Patreon supporters, those of you that make a monthly commitment to the show to help us continue to grow uh, the size of our team, the depth of our journalism and of course the product that we bring you um while you receive our patreon supporters do a top line report exclusive to you check your email inboxes every sunday night or monday morning that's where you'll get our top line report that's put together by the team at y station it's been a busy show i look down it's like two hours in we've still got emails to read we've still got things to talk about i mean it's it's, it's just one of those weeks where there's a lot going on, but I think collectively people are coming together and saying and, and demanding conversations. And, and I'm grateful, uh, number one, Sarah, for the work that you've been putting in and making mm-hmm. these happen. But you also look at the the feedback from from our audience uh, today, and it, and it's resonating strongly. I was I was particularly impressed with the lineup this morning. Uh, conversations about words that we use and, and and appropriate actions to take and consultation before action and listening is anything jump out in particular at you from from the expert voices that we've heard this morning you love doing this to me I Ryan. Do. you just love it just to I be do. like what what's jumping out at you i i just i so appreciate the idea I mean, you, you just summed it up so beautifully. The idea that it's, yes, we need to take action, but first it's listening and consultation that we don't just get to decide, oh, I need to do something. Our action, and it, maybe I'm stating the obvious, but our actions have consequences. Our words have consequences. I also just, uh, my takeaway is that I, I will definitely be referring to myself more and not shying away from referring to myself as a settler. Um, When we talked about partners in treaty, um, we are all treaty people. It's not just indigenous, it's non-indigenous folks Mm -hmm. as well. So um, just being really, oh, I don't want to use like a catch, kind of like a catchy trendy word, but I just, I want to be intentional about, uh, uh, about my, my word use. I mean, I I try to be, I, I like, I strive to be. Um, I can attest to that. Yeah. You're, you're 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 well no but i mean that's a compliment that's not a, that's not a swipe you, you are a very intentional person you're a very contemplative person as is our other teammate mm-hmm. sam brooks and I, i'm curious to know sam what you i mean you know maybe, maybe these are unfair questions i'm asking you if there's something that you've taken from today but but typically for me there'll be kind of these one or two or three moments they're often exhibited in the tweets that we send out in the afternoon of the you know the sort of the 20 to 45 second clips of a guest where we go that was something that really grabbed our attention what was it for you today sam i, yeah, I was going to say like you got an hour for me to break down everything i've been learning over the last couple of days huh. but it, it's it's you know i i think the the big one i i love that we dug into as sarah was just saying the whole idea of the term of settler and and, and being more comfortable with calling ourselves settlers uh we are we we came and we settled this land and and there was a time when we were proud of it and then we avoided speaking about it and now it's 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 coming back with a little bit of a different definition and 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 it it means the same thing and we need to be more comfortable with it but the other thing that uh Samantha Krishnapalai uh, pointed out is you know i i loved when she talked about acknowledging that she's benefited from colonialism and that was really interesting that she has privilege and those of us that have privilege privilege are implored to use our privilege. It's okay to say, yes, I, I am sitting in this chair in an air-conditioned studio on a ridiculously hot June day uh, in, in fairly nice clothes talking to people on the internet because colonialism happened. That's, that's what founded the basis of where we are. And, and it, it gave us this comfortable society that we're living in. But the problem is it came at the expense of making 
a lot of people very, very, very uncomfortable. So becoming more comp- cont- uh, contemplative, well, it took a moment to get out, um, of, of what my own privilege looks like and how I can use it to make things better. Because, you know, there's sitting and wallowing in self-pity is not the way to go. It's, it's you have to take action. You have to use your privilege. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And and I thought it was even interesting, the conversation that, that, that our real talkers were having, those that join us live every morning, this this community that gathers. It's it's not lost on me. People always we our member our, uh, our team member, Katie, that handles all of our merch out of Calgary. Um, Katie reached out to me the other day and we we're just talking business about a couple of things. And she says, you should see the notes I get from real talkers. Like she says, she was getting inquiries from a couple of people last week about merch. And they had some questions about our online shop at Ryan And, uh, and she said like, they're including like compliments about the show and sending me cat photos. She's like, she's like, I don't even, she's like, where did you find these people? And I was like, I feel like the people found us. We found them. I don't know what's going on, but it's a community that's not afraid of conversations. And even today, um, what was it? No blame, no shame, no guilt. Was that what Senator Labacane Benson said? Yeah. And even and even how real talkers were wrestling with that and, and sifting through and determining what that means, I thought was was really, really important. We'll continue this this conversation tomorrow. And uh, we'll continue to take a look at what governments across the country, provincial governments I'm talking about, including here in Alberta, are saying about things like renaming schools. Um, Sam, we're not ready to wrap quite yet. I know I kind of tricked you there. I kind of threw you for a bit of a loop, but I still want to tell people about a couple of things. I I did throw you a curveball there. That one's on me. Um, Sam's just doing his job, but but we're going to keep these conversations. Yeah, what's up? I just wanted to see, like, can I take a point off of your uh, of your score on the scoreboard? Um, I mean, I'd still be, what, 375 points ahead of the two of you uh, because it's very arbitrary and I end out the points and and but I can take one off. Right. Y- well, I mean, I mean, technically, yeah. I mean, I don't mind it. Like Sam, what, what just happened there is Sam is like at the Olympic 100 meter dash where the gold medal favorite false starts. Yeah. And but you only get two false starts and you're out. And so the fans of the gold medal favorite will be like, don't do it again. Don't disqualify yourself. However, we love it because you're ready. You're ready. Your calves, your hamstrings, They're your quads quivering. are quivering and twitching and ready to rock. And Sam's just bringing his gold medal game every single day. And I'm not going to blame him for wanting to roll the extra like he's trained to do. But I had to tell you all about the Canada Greener Homes Grant. And you can find it online. I'm not going to get through the URL here because it's long and complicated. Just Google Canada Greener Homes Grant. You know who put that on my radar? Jake Kubiski, who's the founder of Kubi Energy. And he said, hey, Jespo, you got to put this on everybody's radar. He says the Canada Greener Homes Grant is something that can make it possible for Canadians to make their home more energy efficient without incurring a lot of the costs they might think. In other words, this is in other words, this is a way to get a bit of a break on a solar install. So. He says, I'm a little afraid. Jake says, I'm a little afraid to bring it up on Real Talk because I know we're about to get slammed. And I said, well, that's kind of the point of advertising here. So if you go to kubienergy.ca, you can ask them about the Canada Greener Homes Grant. You could make your sustainability plan a reality as early as this month. The team at Kubi is ready to talk to you. Remember, all their installers are electricians, electrical apprentices, and they're all tesla certified and we'll wrap today's show by reminding you that the team at local waste is buckling up along with the rest of us for trash talk coming up on friday you can send your trash talk emails to us to talk at ryanjesperson.com we've already got some hilarious ones we've got some serious ones uh it's a way for you to blow off a little steam as we gather together and 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 bring the universe back to balance Uh, the team at local waste has been talking trash for more than a quarter century and one of the services they offer if you're a bad contract with one of their competitors a contract you need to get out of because quite frankly you're bleeding money right now and it just doesn't make sense the team at local waste will commit the resources to get you out of that deal you can learn more by looking up Mikkel, lauren and chris at localwaste.ca all right my man let's roll it A smooth transition into the music that reminds you that now it's time to go about the rest of your day as a good human, an enlightened and empowered one, a community member making a difference. Tomorrow morning, we'll talk to historian Sean Carlton. Dr. Jody Carrington joins us. Plus, we learn about the age of fitness and your emails. We'll talk to you then.